Thank you so much. Um, I'm Mary Miller. I work at the Treasury. I've been at the Treasury for about two years. Uh, prior to that, I spent 26 years in the private sector. I started out at a very small company in Baltimore, a private company called T. Rowe Price. And um, I was there over the period of time where the company went public and grew into, of course, today a national company. I have never taken the kinds of risks that you have taken as entrepreneurs. I have jumped at the opportunity to come and talk to this group because I think what you do is so interesting and exciting. I'd say the biggest risk I took was when I quit my comfortable job and came to the government. <laughs> uh, but I would say it's not a risk, it's a privilege. It has been an extraordinary time to be working in this administration and on these issues. My first assignment at the Treasury was financial markets. And I translated that role as being one of strong engagement with the financial markets. You can't talk about them unless you're facing people in the markets every day. So my days are filled with meetings like this, of talking to people who do real things in the real economy, and translating that back into the Treasury policymakers, secretary, senior staff, and sometimes the White House staff on what we're seeing in the economy and financial markets. A couple of things I might mention that I've done that are of interest, I think, in particular to this setting. We have hosted a series at the Treasury called Women in Finance, and we've brought in investment managers and market participants who are women to give us their perspective, not only on the markets, but also on the business of being in the markets and understanding the challenges and issues that they face. A second thing that I worked on that I'm quite um, excited about was a conference we hosted a year ago called Access to Capital for Small Companies. And we'd been hearing so much about a you know, sort of very dry pipeline for IPOs, for companies trying to find capital in a very different economic and financial climate, that we brought in a bunch of people and asked people from all sectors of this, academics, market participants, exchanges, small business owners, tell us what's going on at ground level. And the ideas from that day translated into a private sector task force that was formed to come back with some good ideas about how we could open the pipeline for capital for small companies. And yesterday, the President signed the Jobs Act, which included some very important um, provisions to help companies grow into being public companies. Um, it also includes provisions for crowdfunding and for ways for small businesses to find capital that I think are quite, quite interesting and quite promising. So we know we're not done. You know, nothing ever um, is a silver bullet to solve every problem. But I think it, it opened the doors to thinking about um, <laughs> opportunities for small companies and how we can do more. So I'll do, I'm going to stop there and introduce my very exciting and dynamic co-chair here, Donna James, who is the chairman of the National Women's Business Council. And I intend to do far less talking and a lot more listening from this point forward. <laughs> oh, now, I, hopefully this will be a dialogue. Um, quick introduction, I do chair the National Women's Business Council. In addition to that, I have my own small consulting practice, Larden & Associates, but I am here on behalf of the National Women's Business Council. And this conversation with you is very much aligned with the work that we do. I'm joined by Jamie Knack, who's also in the council, but she's also a businesswoman. She'll introduce herself, and we'll ask you to introduce yourselves very quickly. So I'm going to try to lead by example. The National Women's Business Council is a bipartisan council of 15 women from across the United States. Our sole purpose is to listen and understand what you need as women business owners in order to grow, promoting the growth of women-owned small businesses. We are advisors to the President, the SBA, and Congress. We also conduct research. Never enough money or time to do all the understanding that needs to be done, so all of these conversations are very helpful in that regard. <coughs> and I will be taking lots of mental notes because I'm sure I can't write as fast. Um, please, let's go around very quickly, introduce who you are, um, and then I want to swing it to someone who is in this room somewhere, Ginger Liu. Um, and so maybe Ginger can be the last person to introduce herself, um, but I want to get very quickly, we do, into this dialogue around promoting the growth of women-owned small businesses. Access to capital is always a topic, but there's also access to markets, there's leadership development, there's the whole continuum 
of Main Street startup all the way to high growth, um, which that continuum is something I'm particularly interested in, um, not just access to capital, but all issues. So why don't we start, it's never any fun, whoever you pick on first, okay, and, and roll around the room. <laughs> My name is Judy Delugach, and I own a company called Olivia, and we uh, are about a $30 million company. I started the company 40 years ago as a record company for women to create opportunities for women in the recording industry, and then morphed 20 years after that into a travel company for women. We charter cruises and resorts for women. Um, I have this extraordinary amount of data on a very amazing segment of the population of women um, throughout the United States and other parts of the world, but particularly uh, in the United States. And I'm very glad to be here. I think one of the things about women entrepreneurs, and I'm just going to say this really quick, is that uh, becoming a, for pub a public company is not necessarily a major goal for most women's businesses. And I think that that's an important thing. It's actually a wonderful thing uh, as well. So I, I hope we get into that a little bit more as well. Hi, my name is Natalia Overdi Noguera. I use my mom's and my father's last names, so it's a mouthful. And I am the founder and CEO of the Pipeline Fellowship. We train women philanthropists to become angel investors, and we have two goals. The first one is to increase the diversity of the US angel investing community. Last year, there were only 12% of US angel investors who were women, and only 5% who were minorities. And the other goal is obviously to create more capital for women social entrepreneurs. And I'm delighted to be here. Teresa Nelson, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at Simmons College in Boston. And I'm also here, second hat, as a member of the advisory board for Astia in New York. Astia is dedicated to identifying and supporting and working with women who want to develop, uh, launch, and grow their high growth ventures uh, across different industry areas. And uh, I was, I'm really glad to hear the emerging dialogue from the SBA that's talking about small businesses, not only as small businesses that will continue to be small, but also those that are launching and hope to grow. And there's so much more work that can be done there at those intermediate steps in education and support and alternate funding sources. So thank you. Uh, Nell Molino, I'm the founder and president of Champion for Women's Economic Independence. We work with women who have micro businesses to grow them to uh, million dollar enterprises. We started a program called Make Mine a Million Dollar Business with American Express Open and have been doing that for six years and are about to have our first reunion of all the, 32% of the women who come through the program are at a million dollars or beyond and have hired hundreds and hundreds of people. And I'm interested, I am interested in this conversation both about access to markets, I think access to markets is a very important issue and it continues to be um, uh, challenging for folks who maybe start out as a small business and could be a larger business as they start to understand what they're capable of. And the access to markets, I think, on some levels is as important as the access to capital. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. I'm Elizabeth Fosca is the CEO and co-founder of We Connect International. And like we bank in the United States, we work with very large corporations like Walmart that want to buy from women in businesses. But We Connect works outside of the United States. And I think that aspect of access to markets that you've both, Donna and Nell, have mentioned is, is absolutely critical. Because at the end of the day, what the women really want is to sell their stuff, their products and their services. And I think for too long, we're just not having a serious conversation about the access to markets. So I, I hope that that's an issue we can address. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Jamie Knack. I'm president and founder of Three Squares, Inc. It's an environmental consulting firm headquartered in Los Angeles, and we have a branch in Argentina. Um, we specialize in environmental conferences and trade shows and also strategic initiatives like electric vehicle charging infrastructure. I'm also a proud council member on the National Women's Business Council, and it's exciting to be here with you all today. Great. Erin Andrew, and I'm with the U.S. Small Business Administration, our Office of Entrepreneurial Development. So we oversee the roughly 13,000 business counselors and trainers across the country that provide pre free counseling and training to anyone who walks through their doors. My name is Lori Yamanaka. I'm president and co-founder of Team CFO. We provide outsourced controller and CFO services to small and mid-sized businesses. So uh, half of our clientele are women-owned businesses, so we get to see up close and personal what happens <coughs> to women-owned businesses who are 
fairly large for the classification. We specialize in people over a million dollars, actually three, three to five million and up. And in my other role, I'm incoming chair for the National Association of Women Business Owners, NABO National. Mm -hmm. And NABO has been running some pilot test programs, education for high-end women, women over a million dollars, um, in conjunction with UCLA. We are very interested in finding or identifying reasons for why women who are fairly successful over that million dollar mark, quite a bit over that million dollar mark, have issues in finance. So when, they're, when we're scoring them against the male, male counterparts, it's not just the women below a million dollars that have issues in the financial acumen or their capacity or capability, it's women who are highly successful. And we don't care about that conversation a whole lot because mm -hmm. I think it's something we probably don't want to publicize, although so now it's out in the open. Yeah, but yeah. I really would like to, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna make the differences that we can. And those you know, $10 million businesses could be $100 million businesses if we had our finance house in order. You're so right. that's what I'm interested in. I call it the donut okay. hole. You know, you get the bite and you think you're there and it's all sweet and then there's this yeah. other hole you fall into. Yep. You gotta figure out how to get out to get to the and, other and side. That, and that hole is big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm Gina Harmon, and I'm the CEO of Axion, the U.S. Network, which is a network of organizations across the country that lend uh, to small businesses here in the U.S. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to be here because there's, it's wonderful to be at the table where small business, and particularly women-owned small businesses, um, is the topic of discussion, and with um, so many talented women in the room, I'm sure that we're going to make some real progress. I'm Callie williams Yost. I am the CEO and founder of the Flex Strategy Group and Work Life Fit Inc. Our primary business is with large companies creating flexibility strategies to make the workplace more flexible. We also give tools and strategies to individuals to help them use that flexibility to manage their work life fit. We do not believe there is a balance, only the work life fit. <laughs> um, I'm interested in this topic of women entrepreneurs. I'm one. But also, for a couple reasons, I find women tend to go into entrepreneurship for the flexibility to manage their work-life fit. <laughs> and they also limit themselves in terms of growth because of the fears around the impact on their work-life fit. So if we could start talking about, again, there is no balance when you're a women entrepreneur, but how can we manage our work-life fit as entrepreneurs to really go for that growth? That's what I'm interested in. Let's Keep going. Oh, your last gender, Lou. Okay, don't forget that. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Kristen Moore. I work at the Department of the Treasury. I'm here on behalf of Bruce. We're so good to be here today. Uh, and one of our primary functions um, at the Department is public engagement. So I think we've seen a couple of people here at the table at the White House Economic Forum. She also participates in the White House Business Council. So a lot of it is this access to capital issue on entrepreneurship. So I'm just curious to hear Um, hi, my name is Dee Poku. I run an organization called the WE Network. Um, WE stands for Women, Inspiration and Enterprise. And um, we're designed for this generation's women leaders to inspire the next generation. So we're very, very focused on um, mentorship and creating a support network for women. Did we get you? No. No, don't. That's, please. Good I'm morning. Coming I'm Sarah Beatty with Walmart. Um, and like Elizabeth said, we, uh, we launched an a women's empowerment initiative at the end of last year um, to devote a significant amount of resources to partnering with women-owned businesses to buy their products and put them on our shelves. Um, we're also doing work with uh, women in farms and factories, um, grants to foundations to, to help women. So um, it's a huge initiative for the company and something we're very proud of. So I'm happy to be here today. And I'm Antonella Pianalto with American Express. We're one of the largest providers of credit to small businesses. Um, we have a particular focus on women business owners, now mentioned our partnership on the Make Mine a Million. Um, another program that we're, we've been spending a lot of time on in the last couple of years is called Give Me Five with another women's organization, Women Impacting Public Policy, to uh, help women entrepreneurs do more with uh, government contracting and reach that 5% goal that the, women is, uh, that the government is supposed to uh, do business with, with women entrepreneurs. Hi, my name is Rachel Sklar. I'm the founder of an organization called Change the Ratio, which is geared towards increasing visibility, opportunity, and access for women. Um, uh, the core is tech and new media and entrepreneurship, but it, I, we called it Change the Ratio specifically so it could address 
all of the uh, inequities um, that we seem to see across every vertical. It's staggering how similar the stories mm -hmm. are. I uh, began as a lawyer. I briefly dabbled in comedy. Uh, and then I covered media, which meant I was covering politics. I covered the and the chair in Hillary in 2008. And when I got to town, I was supposed to be a democracy, and then I discovered all of the issues were um, remarkably similar to others that I had covered and experienced. Um, and I'm an impatient sort of person, so I tackle visibility first because that's something that I know I can deal with and have an impact on, both through my own network and through haranguing people on Twitter who don't have enough women <laughs> at their conferences. <laughs> Hi, my name is LaShawn Martin. I'm CEO and founder of Shooty Girl, which is a rhinestone t-shirt company. And we are doing our best to expand to get in places like Target and Walmart and Macy's and different things like that. The company actually started with my two young daughters, who I am empowering to be their own CEOs and their own business owners. They're eight and nine now, and they actually design for our company. Um, I also represent Mocha Moms, which is a national organization of stay-at-home women of color. We have 3,000 moms across the country in 29 states, and a lot of them are new business owners trying to bring wealth and income into their households because of the economy. So I'm here for two different reasons. Let's go and then back I'm on. Lorraine Cole, and I'm uh, director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion at the Department of the Treasury. And uh, our role is uh, not only workforce diversity, but to ensure fair inclusion of minority and women-owned businesses uh, in all of the business activities at Treasury. And Treasury uh, exceeded the 5% goal. My name is Christina Alfaro, and I'm with McDonald's Corporation. I work in communications, and I also work closely with diversity groups. I recently became more involved with the women's networks, and we have a strong network of, of women franchisees, <coughs> suppliers, and employees. So I'm here to learn about the opportunities and challenges that women in business face, and make sure that I am the, the perfect liaison for our women. Excellent. Excellent. Hi, my name is Una Trim. I'm the Communications Director for the National Women's Business Council. Um, as Donna had mentioned, um, we are advisors to the SBA, the White House, and Congress, so a lot of my job uh, involves outreach efforts to learn about the policies and programs, both in the public and private sector, that um, have an impact on women business owners. Hi, my name is Rosina Rubin. My company is Attitude New York. We've been around for 26 <laughs> years. We provide chauffeur transportation, which is something that usually conjures up images of people that sit in the back seat. But the business is every much about people who sit in the front seat, people who work in the office, people who work in the garage. We've got 62 employees. We've never laid anybody off, and we've had health insurance since the day we hired our first employee. I also uh, chair a group of small business uh, people who um, work on issues to educate um, Senator Gillibrand. And uh, it is very interesting how across industries the issues are the, very much the same. And I'm very much interested in um, mid-range businesses because I see a lot of things being done for startups and I see talk about corporate tax rates, but in the middle is, is where there's a lot of growth potential. Thank you. I'm Victoria Elenowitz, I'm managing director or a managing director of Golden Seeds, which is the third largest early stage investor group in the US, uh, including men as well. Um, we have about 240 individual investors, about 80% uh, of them are female. And um, so we're investing primarily in, in businesses that are scalable, so they will be growing growing fast in over a five year period from series from series A to about thirty to hundred million dollars and that's sort of our sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, and we've invested in about the last couple of years about ten businesses a year and and follow on rounds of course for businesses in our portfolio. We we have about fifty businesses in the portfolio now and the main thing about the portfolio is that that it must then each the business must have one female in the C-suite um, with significant equity and management, uh, management um, responsibility. 
Excellent. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Toya Powell. I'm the Director of Government Engagement with the U.S. Black Chamber. We support 105 African American chambers um, in 17 states and 240,000 minority owned businesses through our five pillars of service, which are advocacy, access to capital, contracting, entrepreneur training, and chamber development. So we're very excited to work hopefully with many of you um, in <coughs> several of those areas to help grow uh, women and minority owned businesses and really all businesses across the U.S. Thank you. I am Sherry Saunders and I'm the Director of Communications and Policy for the Business and Professional Women's Foundation. And uh, we are made up of members, many of whom are small business owners, women business owners, um, as well as, as non-business owners, both. Uh, our current project that we're working on is uh, launching, we have just launched, a mentoring program for women veterans and military spouses to help them achieve successful careers. And many of those careers will be in small business. Many of them want to start their own businesses. And uh, so we're looking for information to help them with that. I'm also putting out the call that all of you have access to networks and we would love to have you sign up to be mentors. It's not something you do face to face. Most of these, and today of the internet, most of our mentorship relationships are done via texting and Skype and <laughs> phone calls and things like that. But we're very anxious to uh, get women who have a wide range of experiences in business and uh, professions to help uh, give back to those who have given so much to us already. Um, so if anyone's interested, just let me know. I'll give you our website and <coughs> we will uh, be sure that uh, we get information because it's a great platform. It's very rewarding to do. And uh, so hopefully we'll welcome you all. <laughs> Good concept. <coughs> Ginger, thank you for being in. Hi, my name is Ginger Liu. Um, I recently left the White House. Um, I was with the National Economic Council. And I've actually spent the last few months uh, driving around the United States. Um, I put on 11,000 miles <laughs> and talked to a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of small business owners to just sort of, you know, get a pulse on what's going on. Uh, because what's happening on the East Coast is really different from what's happening on the West Coast, and what's happening in Indiana is really different from what's happening in Oklahoma. And I talked to a lot of, uh, you know, women entrepreneurs in particular. And what's uh, both encouraging and a little bit discouraging, but encouraging is that there's tremendous energy. A lot of women are getting involved in all aspects of different types of businesses. Um, and the discouraging thing is that some of the same issues that we are keep recurring. Mm -hmm. It's whether it's access to capital, whether it's um, how do I find information about markets and growth, um, the work balance issue with family taking care of elderly parents, um, uh, sometimes getting out of uh, uh, difficult or abusive relationships, uh, and and but you know it, you know a woman really deals. There's so many of these issues on you know, multiple levels, emotional, professional, intellectual, et cetera. And it's, what I'm hearing from this group is we have a great cross-section. We've heard mention about the, the missing middle. So I refer to it as the missing middle. Don called it the donut hole. But you know, it is true. Studies have shown women businesses tend to grow to about four to five million dollars. And then they cap off. They drop off. And we don't really know why. Is it because of lack of mentors, you know, lack of an overall network to help move you up the, the value chain? Um, I, I'm involved with an entrepreneurship group here in, in Northern Virginia called Founders Corps. And it's, and it's all CEOs, uh, some of them successful serial CEOs. It's all guys. And I said, where are the women? You know, hey, why aren't women part of this group? And B, if they don't want to be part of this group, why don't they form their own group? But again, studies have sure shown that besides capital, the number one request of entrepreneurs is mentorship. Mm -hmm. had, if having a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with somebody that you can talk to, share your problems, and get feedback. So I hope from this group we can hear your ideas and your suggestions. This is a proactive administration. Obviously, we can't do all things, like as the president said, 
the drag thing wrong. <laughs> 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 it's true. <laughs> it's so true. Um, but you know, if, if you have ideas and suggestions about what this administration should be thinking about now and for another term, you know, but put put it on the on the list because um, this is this is something I think this this administration is really committed to to the issue of gender, equality, gender parity, um, and, and uh, promoting uh, the women's, women's economic security. If I may. Um, I, I, I haven't driven around, but I've you know, put on about 100,000 miles every year for the past 12 years, meeting women and working with women business owners. And I am increasingly convinced, and I'm reminded sitting here today, there's so much activity there is so much activity. You know, we do Make Money Million with American Express. We're doing this urban rebound program with Sam's Club Giving Program, which is getting women from 50,000 to 250,000 in revenue. Because there seem to be some real barriers, whether they're real or, you know, at, at every stage of this. And I, I have started to think about this. And, I, and, and I, I, I think this is the role of government somehow. Because there is so much activity out here, either in the, in the private sector or in the o NGO sector or in different sectors of government, how to make women more aware of all. There, there are plenty of women now at 30, 40, 50, 100 million. There are not a lot of them, but there are enough of them. We've had the experience recently of hooking up with one woman who's at $300 million, who's a Walmart supplier. She found Count Me In through the president of Walmart and came to us and said, I really am at a stage in my company. She has eight children. For anybody who's worried about balance, she has eight children. Eight children, two sets of twins, so it's not as gruesome as it sounds, but eight. 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 Not as many pregnancies as all um, Maybe it's more gruesome. Um, yes, eight children, six pregnancies. Um, but that relationship in three months has done more because there's somebody at 300 million who is literally saying to people who are at a million or 500,000, this is what you do. This is what you do. This is what you do with the kids. This is what you do with the business. This, this, is, this is how I did it. You know, this is, this is and, and she, she, she literally took five of them to Bentonville this week for a fashion show that they got to participate in and meet 50 buyers. These women, you know, who make clothes, make different things, got to meet 50 buyers. It was, <laughs> And, and I, I, I think there's got to be, I have this image now of like we're all on this merry-go-round or it's either a merry-go-round or a tornado where we're trying to, you know, move women along and there are these rings that they can grab. And I don't think we have fully defined for them where the rings are, you know, from, from startup to 100 million, where they are, who's there, what's in the government, what's in the private sector, because there's a lot of activity now. I have watched, I mean, we started Count Me In 12 years ago. I have seen a lot of development of activity. There's a lot of activity, a lot of great commitment from, from, from big global companies. There's a lot of, you know, the kind of company that you have that's helping women with the CFO problem, because if there's a problem that they all have, it's that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do we start to quantify it? Because it's not, I, I used to think it was just confidence. It is both confidence and awareness. It is, it is awareness of how far you can go. I have asked this before, I'm gonna ask it again. The president needs to go to women-owned businesses on his campaign stops. Women need to see other women being successful and how they do it. They, you know, we have people that have gone from no jobs to 300 jobs in, in less than five years. How do we start to highlight them, not just because this administration has made some of that activity possible, for other women to see them? Because that, to me, this issue of mentorship, I think it is beyond the mentorship. And I think the word mentorship is tough here, because mentorship, I think, is associated with corporations and businesses. Women need to meet other women. They need to see people who look like them, who are, who are the better tennis player, if you will. You know, you know, when you play tennis with a better tennis player, you get better at the tennis. And they don't know enough of them because we get pigeonholed in these groups of, you know, if you're at 50,000, 250, a million, 5 million, whatever it is, you're with the other people who are at 5 million, which is helpful, but you need to be talking to the people who are at 100 million or meeting them somehow. And I think that's something that somehow around these issues of finance and around some of the other issues we might be able to do together. Um, that everyone in this room could start to put forth a way where women could see what the opportunities are because they still do not know. 
they I, don't. I agree with you. There's a lot of segmentation in the market yep. naturally. Yep. And at, at first, when you were talking, I was going, no, 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 there's a lot of people out there and there's a lot of availability. But you're right. They segment according to, to size. The closest you get maybe is some kind of industry. Right. But, but that's very rare. So I agree with you there. The, I see it as two problems. One is the soft side, which is the relationships, the men, the eight children. Yes. So, so yeah, the eight children. Got, uh, so we've got that merry-go-round and people are grabbing, you know, but they haven't worked out. They have no arms. They, they, they go for it, they grab it, and they're not ready to catch it, and they fall off. Boom. Nice analogy. You know, I, well, just building on yours. Yes. So, <laughs> it, and, and maybe it's because I see it through the financial world. Yeah. I mean, that is the, the, the commonality. I don't care if you're a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand, ten million, a hundred million. At, at first, when we saw the data and how weak women business owners as compared to males are. So this is not just whatever, it's, you know, quantitatively, we just are not doing as well financially, our financial acumen, how we use finance in business. Do we use finance account? I'm, I'm not even talking finance, I'm talking account, I'm talking about basics. So at first I was horrified, but then I've decided to spin it and I go, wow, these women are really successful mm -hmm. in spite of themselves. Mm -hmm. exactly. they, are, they, are not, they are not maximizing one of their tools that the men, or forget the men, anybody who's a very good best practice business, of course, accounting, finance is a standard, you use it, it's metrics, you have, you know, companies like GE have made their fortunes on, on the best practice in that area. If we could just get women to come up to average, what kind of growth could we have? I think that would wipe yeah. out the, the, the disparity. When you were, it was such a visual when you were saying about falling flat on their faces. And in some ways, I like to challenge and be provocative about how we need to actually get more women to fall flat on their faces and um, risk more. Last year, in terms of women entrepreneurs getting funded, you know, we talk about women entrepreneurs aren't getting funded. They're also not pitching. Last year, only 12% of women entrepreneurs pitched. From that 12%, 26% secured funding. Last year, of minority-led companies, only 11% were the ones pitching. And out of that 11%, only 17% were securing funding. And a huge part, uh, and I've, I'm seeing it from the other side, because we, um, we are huge believers in learn by doing. So we have a signature event where we invite women entrepreneurs to pitch. We realize that it's these women are waiting too late in a way. You know, like they want to cross all the T's, they want to yeah. dot all their eyes. Reed Hoffman from That's LinkedIn, true. he once said, "If you're no longer embarrassed of of your product when you launch, you have waited too long." Yeah. And wow. so, in terms of just positioning it as a gender, um, a gendered issue of perfectionism, really pushing and engaging all these women to just go out there, just. If you want money, ask for feedback. Any sort of conversation you can have, whether it's with the 50 buyers, notwithstanding whether they end up securing a contract or not, exactly. they're going to get a better sense of how buyers think yes. so that the next time that they actually meet a buyer, hopefully they will be at a better place. I think, though, it's, um, you know, there, there's, there's a reason that women tend to want to make sure it's perfect before they go out or want to be safe because women get less opportunities. They, they have less room to fail. You know, when, like, a really good example is Bridesmaids. The big deal about Bridesmaids before it came out was that this was a woman-centered, yeah. woman-written, woman-driven, no dudes in it, really, <laughs> comedy. And if it flopped, then that was gonna, like, close the door for any other woman-authored, woman-centered, uh, Comedies, which is ridiculous because, like, I don't know, I don't even know the numbers on Get Him to the Greek, but like, if that flops, that doesn't mean that Jonah Hill's never gonna do another film. So it's, uh, you know, you see that a lot in this industry. You see people saying, like, well, you know, in like VCs' portfolios, like, well, we have, like, we have a woman run company, or we saw, we, like, we see women, but they're not there yet, right? So if they, you don't wanna be the woman that's not there yet, and you don't wanna m risk your chance at you know, finally getting in front of someone when, as women, it's so much harder to get that meeting, get that warm intro, get in front of people and actually get to the table and pitch to often a boardroom of men who, you know, often are like, you know, women are gonna rent dresses for formal occasions, what? My wife wouldn't do that. By the way, that's actual 
<laughs> feedback for Rent the Runway. Um, <laughs> it's a niche and, market. Right. And, and so, you know, it's, it's sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't, because one, one of the things, like Sheryl Sandberg has been fantastic in really drawing attention to women and, and, and sort of their, their contributions, but when you talk about sort of like the ambition gap or like women leaning back or not stepping forward, like it's not that there isn't a reason for that. So I always sort of try to highlight the context because, you know, you learn behavior and you learn behavior because of feedback you get and cues you get and women get different cues. Mm -hmm. So, so let, me, let me just try to segment the conversation for a second because one of the things I notice is we get into um, a sort of diagnosing and we're not all clear which patient we're talking about, if I can kind of paraphrase. So I'm, I'm gonna to throw this at the, our Golden Seeds representative because of the work you do and how you're looking at, I'm gonna call um, high potential growth businesses that people are willing to put their dollars in. Then I wanna come to the middle and then I wanna come to the startup because so I wanna, create three patients, <laughs> three opportunity sets, um, and, and really start to see what's common across them and what's a little different. I, I think I know what the answer is, but I always love having this conversation because there are some differences, I think. So let's, let's talk about the profile of the kind of woman-owned business that your group puts money into, if that's a fair way to, to ask the question. Well, we... The, the business would be somewhat developed. I mean, it, it's going to have friends and family money, maybe 100, 150,000 in it already. So, because we we sort of pride ourselves on doing a lot of due diligence and analysis, and we, I would say, 80% or so of our members are actually out of the corporate world. So we're very collaborative, which is a, 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 which everybody in the industry admires, and we get ex extremely good um, reviews on our on our procedures for, for funding um, and on our terms. Um, but, but of course, even in, in our group, we only have a small portion of entrepreneurs. And so the, the question, you know, where are the, where are the examples is, is very right. Okay. Um, so one, one thing that we do is, we, you know, we gather together, our, we now have over 45 women CEOs who, who are a group. Now they're all over the US, so they don't see each other all the time, but we bring them together. And the, the thing that they love more than anything, well, the two things, one is to meet each other and exchange views <coughs> on how they should be growing their own businesses. And the other thing is to meet entrepreneurs who've done it already. Yeah. And in our group, we, we have not only women, but men, but there are fewer women entrepreneurs. So it ends up being that, that a larger portion of the men members are giving them advice on uh, practical day-to-day -day advice. I mean, that's just, I'm just giving you, you know, No, no, that's why I would, how yeah. it looks. <clears throat> so really, the, the, so there definitely is a shortage. I mean, now we're kind of addressing the, um, the need for those women who are growing their businesses, you know, through the early millions, uh, to, you know, to talk to each other. But still, there's, there's, less, uh, there's less opportunity for those women to see other women at higher levels. But they're they're falling but back. We're, we're seeing that, <laughs> hopefully. So. Yeah, more now, but still not enough. Well, right. well, you know, not so many, not so many at the next level, mm -hmm. hundred million dollar level. So. Um, and not know. as available. So we so we have we have you know we have, we do have a bunch of people in our organization that have done that, but the but the larger portion would be guys. And not as available. Now was saying so they're not they're, as many, and they have eight children. I mean, seriously. I mean, the level of responsibilities that they have. Businesses too. Yes, and and I I think, you know, this is something I am always thinking about. What what you know, with the with the power that the government has, could could the government assemble and and know and know, a hundred women at a hundred million or more. Who they are. Who they are and how because I I, I think. Seeing the reaction of people at you know to 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 meet and talk to someone who's done this who they feel, I mean, don't feel it, she's like them. Mm -hmm. the, it, 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 it was just like a match to gasoline in terms of the, the, the changes people were willing to make and the things they were willing to do, that if someone else had said, you know, you really ought to put your picture here or do something like that, they would have said, oh yeah, maybe. They were on it, they did it, and it helped them. And I, I think there's, there's a real, that would be a great thing to do, to quantify how many there are 
and who are they and how many of them want to step forward in some way for some kind of exchange, even if it's you know on the internet, so that people could see them and that know their sense. story. Mm -hmm. I know we're going to run out of time. One more comment on that size of the market so we get to middle and the small. I'd love to just throw in the idea of accelerators like Astia, not only Astia, but organizations that really dedicate mm -hmm. themselves to finding the women, connecting with them, who do want to grow aggressively, right? And so locations now in um, Palo Alto, New York, London, and Bangalore, right? Building a coalition and bring to everyone's attention. I think the other segmentation is across our uh, roles. So the nonprofit, the government, mm -hmm. the entrepreneurs, the investors, the corporate interest. So there's a 10-year commitment now to, to an event called the We Own It Summit, weownitsummit.org. Mm -hmm. And that's to bring all the parties together across all those different sort of routes to have the conversation about growth, because we also need to be coordinated mm -hmm. um, so that we're having these sorts of yeah. conversations. And I really appreciate the two summits that have been held for that very reason, because I'm not sure I'd come into contact with all of you otherwise. And, and that's a summit for high growth coordination. You're focusing on high growth, high potential business. Correct. 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 So, and yeah. Yep, yeah, June 28 and 29 in New York City. So let's move real quick. Go ahead. Just a quick caveat because I, no. I totally agree with that. We don't, we're not as well coordinated as we need to be and there's too much to be done and too few resources. But on the other hand, too often we talk to each other and we yeah. have to stop doing that. The Clinton Global Initiative is doing a great job of trying to embed the gender lens across all of the work of mm -hmm. the, the members of the Clinton Global Initiative. And I know there are other organizations that aren't the traditional gender women focused organizations. We have to have to start having those conversations um, beyond the, our network. Here, here. You know, it's a good call out. We Let's do only have like Minutes. So oh, I knew that was going <laughs> to happen. So much going let's, on. Let, let's let's talk about the middle because I think we danced a little bit on the small, but not hard enough. But the middle that that group I call it the donut hole. I call it some people call it the missing middle. Some say it's before you get to a million. Okay. Um, even beyond a million, I'm a six million dollar company. I was an eight million dollar company and I'm very happy to be a ten million dollar company. I never wanted but companies that have, say, 50 million companies are too large to benefit from crowdfunding. Are, I'm sorry, are too large to music. Yeah. And Rosina said something that, you know, you clarified that you want to be a $10 million, however you don't want to be a $100 million company. And there, that reminds me of a book called The Big Enough Company by Adelaide Lancaster and Amy Abrams. And they mm -hmm. interviewed a lot of un women entrepreneurs particularly, and really having us accept and acknowledge that some women entrepreneurs are not interested in being that hundred million company and others and are. And respect that. And, yes. and respect and it. And, that. Yeah. and at the t same time, I'm very comfortable being the devil's advocate and saying how we had three patients here. And if this had been about male entrepreneurs, we would just be talking about one patient. <laughs> and that one patient would be like the high growth one. Right. Yeah. Yep. 
Last word for the smaller <coughs> sector of our, our smaller Harvard patients. Harvard is small, smaller than this. Um, <laughs> but I think there was an interesting experience two years ago when Goldman Sachs announced a $200 million fund and defined the companies they were looking to support as three, mil, uh, three years of revenue, sorry, yes, three years of, <laughs> of experience, um, three to five million dollars of revenue and a cash infusion of somewhere between 150,000 and 350,000 dollars. And they went across the country looking for organizations that were capable of making those loans and found three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that is um, because the businesses in that space, um, everyone assumes can be collateralized in kind of traditional ways, and they cannot be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you take an organization that focuses on micro, right, and has you know a kind of lumpy um, liquidity plan, <laughs> and you start making loans of that size, you, and you're extending terms to four or five years. The business model gets to be really hard to manage. It is a different business it's model. It's a different model. Yeah, I think we can be smart enough to know how to underwrite them, but the um, the instability in our sources of debt, you know, makes it really hard to tie up that kind of money over a long period of time. Well, there's no return on it. I right. just want to say, well, well we're used to it. no return. <laughs> <laughs> But have gone through every level of up to mm -hmm. the level that we're at, and, and try and went into possibly going public and going whoa, and having bringing in a CEO to bring us there, and no, um, there was a lot of pitfalls to that. But the thing is, a lot of women's businesses have to develop. I don't think we want to see businesses go from here to here. There's a lot of steps in between that women haven't done yet, and you know. Um, starting a business when you couldn't even get a credit card without a man signing for it, which was the 70s, and not being able to get any credit, to today the bank's falling all over us because we grew 40% last year. What? How could that possibly happen in this economy, much less a women's business that you know, has been there for a very long time and has, you know, keeps um, going against all of the hurdles? But it's so many women need to look. Let's get past the one million to the five million, and let's let's really concentrate on that. And then those of you who really have the expertise to concentrate on growing those other businesses, do that. But let the government help in that area because that's where most of the women are going to be. That's just the reality, and it's a great reality. It's a great opportunity for women, and we haven't seen that before, and we're seeing it. So let's help that. Well, I, I, you, yeah. you're right. The numbers, what, 6% of all small businesses are, are, are over a million dollars? And of that, only women are, I'm rounding up 2%? Yes. yes. You know? Yes, that's I mean, so, so I, I do think we need to focus on the high growth. You've got to water that. That's going to take probably less water, to be honest, because I think those women are going to make it no matter what. The, the startup and small businesses, I think there's so many resources out there that, it, it, to your point, all over the place. Through, yeah. Community colleges, nonprofits, mm -hmm. colleges, whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I, the middle is missing to me, mm -hmm. and and then when you really look at it, that's where we have our huge growth opportunity because we aren't going to get to that high growth area if we don't go through this part here. And and we, I don't. It's like you're the ugly teenager. You know, it's the teenager years because they're twixt and tween. They're too big for this, mm -hmm. uh, too small for this, too knowledgeable for this. You know, not knowledgeable enough, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard, i got to say this. It's, if there were an easy answer, then people would put it forward. It's a low return. They're hard to find. People don't want to admit it because in my field, you know, I would, would go up to, to potential clients and would think they're this size because we've seen them. We found out they're not because they're embarrassed because they're in the middle and they're more close to this side. So people don't want to, they're willing to identify when they're small or really large in the middle. You don't know. So I think there's, there's one other segment really critical just to mention, putting on my professor hat. So I'm at Simmons College of Historic Women's Liberal Arts School. 80% of our undergraduates identify that they want to start a business someday. These millennial uh, men and women are different than yeah. most of the people in this room. Let's not forget them, because if we can invest a little bit in them right now, Maybe not it's, their, it's not their first job out of college, but for some it is. 
But somewhere in their career track, they're going to do things that are extraordinary. And I'm at, can I just, oh, okay. can I just add one last thing? <laughs> Whatever we do to share stories, I think women entrepreneurs, though, we have to share the life part of the equation. Yep. Have the women entrepreneurs honestly support each other and mentor how they manage their lives, because I do believe in the women entrepreneurs that I talk to, they're holding themselves back from growth out of fear of the impact on their families. Mm -hmm. And the only stories they have is Steve Jobs, who had to write a book before he died so his kids understood why he was never, I mean, women, <laughs> listen, listen, women listen to that and they think, okay, well, that's what you got to do, and I'm not going to do that. And it was interesting, because at the Barnard um, event, Arianna Huffington tried to get her panel to talk about their balance. It was like crickets went off. They couldn't even, it was so awkward. They started talking about a million other things. Time. Yeah, but it was, hard, but it was hard for you to answer the question about balance, because there is no balance. So how do we get to be honest to say, you know what, running your own business, it could be really stressful sometimes, but here's how we do it. Go for it. Your kids are going to be fine. You know, talk about that honestly. I think okay. we have to talk about the right. fact that it's great to be the boss. Yeah. It's great to be the boss. <laughs> um, it, it is a great shame to try to bring this to a close. I, I will, I'll, say, um, I'll say one thing. One, one of my colleagues. How bad. Hold it. One of my colleagues at the Treasury had a great line the other day. She said, I don't have work-life balance, but I do have work-life satisfaction. Um, Yay. Yay. That's, that's nice. nice phrase. phrase. Um, Yay. I think one of the great powers we do have here in the government, and we have limited powers, but we do have a convening power. And I think yes. yeah. to bring people together like this and to hear all of your stories is just so, so amazing. And um, I thank every one of you for making the effort to be here. I think we heard a lot of interesting things today. Great. It was a great event. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.